I'm Russell Lyons. I'm currently CEO of a company called Innovation Software, but quite a few years ago, more than I care to remember, I was one of the founders of Torch Computers way back in 1981. And I'm Martin Baines. Uh, I currently earn a living as an independent consultant, um, but the reason I'm here today is the fact I was one of the early employees of Torch Computers along with Russell and many other people. The way that Torch Computers started was really quite interesting and like many businesses, uh, completely coincidental. I was actually working in uh, shipping in around 1980 and met up with Martin uh, Vliet and Body and Peter Harris who were the uh, two partners in a company called Climar. We liked each other. I was actually just about to start a business in the Middle East and about a year and a half later I was looking at uh, deciding to sell, uh, to uh, create some software and having made some designs for the software I was looking for uh, a company or some partners to help me develop it. I found my little black book called Martin and Peter and went to Cambridge one afternoon. Uh, to cut a long story short we again got on like a house on fire and I think we ended up exchanging shares in entirely worthless companies but from then on the uh, uh, mold was set for uh, us to actually work together. We, uh, in those days, rented out part of our offices to uh, Herman Hauser and Chris Curry, who a lot of people will know, uh, and this was in Bridge Street in Cambridge. They, during the course of 1981, I think it was probably around August or September, uh, won the uh, BBC Micro, and because we were friends, which meant that we used to go to the pub every night after work, uh, suggested to us that uh, we might like to help them with their quest to produce a business version of the BBC Micro. We only had to be asked once. The rest is history. We immediately put together a business plan, uh, worked out that we would uh, create a uh, computer. We had some uh, good staff at the time, although the, not very many, I think there were probably only about two, Peter Headland and... Yeah. Uh, uh, but we went to Barclays Bank, met up with, uh, amongst others, Walter Herriot, who is now quite famous in Cambridge, I should say very famous in Cambridge. And uh, we were able to persuade Barclays Bank to give us £250,000 to start upon the research and development for the machine, which was an amazing, uh, uh, amazing thing. Uh, that period because we had about six months to produce this machine before we reckoned we would run out of money. So this started, uh, uh, I guess, again about September time. Yep. Martin came on board uh, and... Uh, well, so, yeah, my, my backstory, <coughs> um, I'm a Cambridge computer graduate, so I, I was actually one of the um, first people to actually do the computer science tripos uh, when it expanded itself to a full two-year course, well, not even a from what previously been a one-year course. And there's a common theme about the Cambridge uh, Computer Lab with Torch in that virtually all of the, the technology founders were part of the university, and we were all pretty much in the same year. Russell mentioned a gentleman called Peter Headland, um, who was the first technologist on board. Um, another gentleman came on board called Ray Anderson, who has sort of been around the industry several times now. I came on board uh, the next one, there and then sort of several other people all joined from the computer lab so it's very much a Cambridge computer lab based company. Um, in terms of the technology, being all bright young things who didn't know what was impossible, we, we were, you know, had a vision that what we wanted was the world's first properly networked um, connected computer and that was what we set out to build. So it had you know, many, many firsts in it. Um, we had the first machine that had a modem in it as standard, the first physically integrated machine sort of, um, that you can see behind us, um, the first machine that had a networking built into it and networking software in there. So it was a, a pretty innovative thing. There was another little thing that sort of Russell being an accountant um, threw at us in that they really didn't want to spend any, any money on licensing anything from anybody. So one of the things we did was we built all of the software, the operating system and everything, completely from the ground up. 
but back then there was already a standard, a thing called CPM, which was the standard for small computer operating systems at the time. We built our own called CPN um, as part of it. Cambridge uh, Program Nucleus. That's right. <laughs> um, uh, it was full of puns as well. There was a command line processor in there that had previously in the version we were cloning called CCP. Ours became the CCCP, <laughs> um, the Cambridge CCP. So, but one of the things about designing it from the ground up gave us was complete freedom to do what we liked. So we actually built a system that was significantly better and more user-friendly than the CPM system that we cloned. It had seen CPM at the time, if you wanted to copy a program or copy a file, you had to type pip something equals something. We just put the word copy into it. If you wanted to network on CPM, you had to go out and buy some third-party software, third-party hardware. We had it all built in. It was just built in, and much as people would be used to today of just connecting a machine, another machine on the network, we just did that. And that was all back in the early 80s, when you know, most people didn't even know what a network was, let alone how to use it. The amazing thing about the CPN operating system was that it had the complete CPN uh, command instruction set. Uh, but not only that, it didn't run on a Z80, it ran on a 6502. So our machine actually had more RAM to run uh, business programs in than other uh, CPM-based Z80 machines. And as I said, I mean, one of the things that we had, we had two processes in there. If you open up uh, the uh, body of a torch, if you can get in with a can opener, that is, um, what you'll find is a big BBC Micro motherboard, which is a 6502 processor. We put all of the, the hard work into that processor. That's where all of the processing did. And so consequently, when you had a business program that had to run on the Z80, you had all of it, um, less of a few bytes. People today who are used to gigabytes of RAM, you know, we had a, a full 64K of RAM on the machine, which may not seem much now, but at the time was a phenomenal amount of uh, power. The other thing that was uh, a first for Torch was that it was the first PC to be uh, given a trip to America on the QE2. There was, in fact, a, 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 a method behind that, or sort of a reason behind the madness. It was that the, uh, all ships in those days, and I came from a shipping background uh, immediately just before uh, Torch, would get their daily orders via Inmarsat and Telex. And Telex was uh, notoriously slow, and uh, Inmarsat was incredibly expensive. It probably still is. The uh, trick with Torch was that it had a superb electronic mailing system within it. So uh, this could actually speed up the transfer of orders, the daily orders from the offices of uh, the QE2 in Liverpool to wherever the ship was in a fraction of the time that it took to send a telex. And uh, we were very happy about that. So, was, uh, the, the owners, so were the owners of the QE2. I seem to remember the uh, two people who got to go on the uh, QE2 were even happier about it. They were. Ray, Ray Anderson and myself were absolutely sick because we actually took them down to Southampton, had a tour around the QE2, saw where the machines were going and thinking, uh, well, uh, there are two more uh, suites for us, but uh, apparently not. <laughs> and in, in many ways, that was a, a story of a lot of what used to go on at Torch. <coughs> it was... You know, clearly a lot of technical people were there being clever, but we also had people like Russell who had a somewhat different view of uh, how life should be in, in a business. So we tended to sort of have you know, quite a lot of uh, fun and games that would go on in the background as well. What sort of different views? Like that uh, we liked making money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we were, uh, Martin, Peter and myself were essentially accountants. Uh, I think I was the closest uh, I had, I'd actually to uh, technology because uh, I, as soon as I qualified as an accountant with Deloitte Haskins and Sells, which is now PricewaterhouseCoopers, which way back in 1973, I was so embarrassed I immediately joined the management consultancy practice, which is now the forerunner of, uh, of what is Ernst and Young, and uh, be became a programmer. But at the end of the day, we were really. Uh, I suppose uh, young businessmen, uh, certainly with a, with a focus on finance, uh, controls over 
the costs up to up to a point. Up to a point. <laughs> but, uh, except our own. But, uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> but it, it was. It, I think this was why. I mean, you have to remember. Here was a company that I think by the time, by its second year, we had something like a, more than a million and a half invested in us, uh, and. I was the old man. I think I was 31. Uh, Martin was 29, and Pete was 27. So, where did the investment come from? The uh, initial investment came from Barclays Bank. The uh, second round of investment, uh, from then on in, came from New Market Venture Capital, which was a joint venture between Casnove and Rockefeller. Something else that should be sort of brought out here as well is, you know, Torch did a, quite a few things that you didn't see other Cambridge companies doing. So Torch actually invested in its own factory um, in Wales with the help of the Welsh Development Agency. So um, part of the seed capital came in through the Welsh Development Agency as well. So yes, it was a Cambridge company, but we also were employing uh, what several hundred people, I think. In That's Wales. right. There were uh, very quickly the company went from six people in 1981 to, I think, 250 by the end of uh, 1982, beginning of 1983. Uh, we actually took over a, uh, a factory in Carnarvon from, uh, which had originally been used by Arfon, which was a, a computer manufacturer as well. And as uh, Martin rightly said, actually we sold 6% of our stock to uh, the Welsh Development Agency for, I think the price was about 263,000. You can imagine this was only about three months after the first round of funding for 20% of our stock to New Market Venture Capital, who were just rubbing their hands with delight at the in <laughs> seemingly uh, a huge capital appreciation over such a short uh, space of time in the company's shares. What were the two different things that you, you two were bringing to, to the company in terms of your personalities and the people that you, you employed and so forth? What was it like with young people then? It was actually, a, it was just amazingly good fun. I think the, uh, uh, if you also uh, bear in mind the people that we mixed with in Cambridge, uh, literally on a daily, nightly, but certainly a nightly basis, um, people like Chris Curry, uh, from, from Acorn. Uh, Clive Sinclair was frequently uh, in the same bars that, uh, that we would go to. Uh, Chris Keatley, uh, if you remember him, yes. who, he was a uh, biotechnology uh, bod from, from Cambridge and he set up a company called, an amaz amazingly successful company called IQ Bio, which developed uh, 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 diagnostic kits using uh, very sophisticated assaying techniques employing monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we uh, uh, had, I think, a lot of fun, created a, a very nice environment for, uh, for, for all of us. We wanted a nice environment, Martin, Peter and myself. Uh, we, we uh, I think, created a very exciting environment for, uh, for the rest of the uh, people that worked in, in, within uh, the company itself. And, uh, and I think also the, uh, the, the, the teamwork, the esprit de corps was, uh, was, was super, as, as Martin said earlier on, at that age, nothing's impossible. That's <laughs> right. and, and Brick walls are to bust through. <laughs> absolutely. And in terms of personalities, I mean, we, had, we had everything. You know, we, we had the you know, archetypal uh, you know, bearded computer hairies um, who would sort of be locked away in the lab um, you probably wouldn't want to sniff too much about the smells that you could see coming out of out of it as they did their designs. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was just remembering <laughs> bottles of milk. But <laughs> you look at the you can't possibly drink that. What? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so, so we, we had to like the, the engine room uh, there and you know, some real characters who were, were just absolute geniuses. Um, I, I guess there, we had some other sort of uh, characters as well. I mean, we mentioned Pete Headland, who was. Uh, you know, he's, he was quite an entrepreneurial thinking, technical person. Uh, you know, they brought myself on because I, you know, I'd, I'd actually spent two years away from Cambridge at that time and actually had done some real work. So uh, I came in and um, sort of set up the uh, customer support organisation and you know, built it from the ground up. But, but that, that's what we did. You know, none of us really knew what we were doing. We just made it up as we went along. 
and uh, is immense. Really pretty fun. well, actually. I mean, remarkably well. That that was uh, uh, that, that was a, certainly a hallmark of uh, Torch. It was a, it was a quality organisation. But in terms of, of people and what they the, uh, their capabilities, Ray Anderson was an amazing guy. Uh, he went on after Torch to set up IX International, which basically was taking some software which was in the public domain and turning it into something which he could sell at uh, quite a large amount of money. I think it was IX, I, uh, terminal emulation software, which got bought by uh, Santa Cruz Operation, yeah. which he became vice president of, got bought for a you know, cool 10 million. Uh, after about uh, probably a year, a couple of years that uh, Ray took building that. And then he's now, he set up Bango in 1995, which is mobile payment uh, software company. 1995, we're talking, this is 20 years, 20 years ago. I mean, he, he was very, very uh, far sighted in uh, what he could see t coming down the line technology wise. And, and as Russell says, I mean, the people there were, were just basically smart. I mean, you, know, you look at them now, you know, people have gone into all sorts of different areas. You know, they've had careers in you know, the big name organisations. Um, but it makes me think back, as well, Russell talking, some of the other things Torch did, did really early that sort of predated them. We actually had a um, Windows icon mouse-based user interface developed that actually ran on that sort of mm. big lump of metal behind <coughs> us um, you know, before the Mac was uh, launched. I, now it you know, probably wasn't the, the the best hardware to run something of that sophistication on, but you know, the fact that they you know, put it there and tried mm. was uh, you know examples of you know, not thinking about uh, what it can do, but you know what it could do and assuming it could. And I'll just say one more thing about uh, uh, people within Torch. Uh, one of the most successful guys to come out of Torch was Peter Harris, who now is uh, chairman of Hotel Chocolat, which he started, and that has been in a phenomenally successful uh, business. Uh, not high-tech, or maybe it is high-tech, I don't know the, ins in, uh, the inside of it, but uh, uh, these were the caliber of people that this uh, fantastic uh, company uh, attracted and uh, grew. And uh, that also segues into something else as well. One of the things to bring out about Torch is that we always thought of ourselves as the, the you can see we're both wearing suits, um, you know, maybe the Harry's didn't wear suits, but we always thought of ourselves as a business company first. So most of the Cambridge computer companies you'll come across were very much coming from the gaming side, from the home PC side of things. We always saw ourselves as, you know, we're going to take the same technology, but actually make it in business. You know, I'm quite early on in the days, we said we would be the next IBM. You know, that was the, the way we were thinking. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but <laughs> <laughs> we had a damn good go. <laughs> well, at that time, as you're, um, you're bringing up this company, you're growing at a phenomenal rate, really. Um, what, were you just living for the company, or um, how did it express itself in terms of the things that you did or the things that you Things that we started to buy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, the, the, a very good part of the time within the company was actually living within the company. <laughs> so, uh, although I think uh, some of us made a reasonable amount of money, there was not an awful lot of time to actually spend it. Um, I just remember uh, when we started Torch. I was living in Kent and driving two and a half hours to Cambridge each day and uh, about two hours or maybe an hour and a half in the evening, depending upon whether I left before uh, one o'clock in the morning or after one o'clock in the morning. And it was pretty much seven days a week for certainly all of the time that it took up until we got uh, the, the, the machine stable. Uh, the prototypes were produced by April of uh, 1982. Went into production with huge hiccups. I just remember the first two months of attempting to manufacture these machines that uh, batches of floppy disk drives simply did not work. They were defective. 
this put a massive hole in our cash flow. Uh, we could see it immediately you could, because we're accountants. Uh, and uh, it was an extremely frightening time, actually. And it, it did change, it put a, put a real strain on the, uh, on, on the cash flow. We had full production uh, facilities with all the people. We had all the frustrations of bad batches of, uh, of components arrive beyond, which were not our control. These are, I won't say who they came from, but <laughs> a very famous Indian manufacturer. And uh, we had the, the staff that we'd taken over from uh, in Carnarvon. They'd been used to patchy history with Arfon, their previous uh, uh, employers. And you could see the looks of bleak looks on their faces, that, oh no, all over again. Uh, and every time I went to the factory, I don't know about you, but I just yeah. used to uh, absolutely pull at my heartstrings uh, and really just willing all of this stuff to actually work. Eventually it did work, but... Uh, it was, it, it was, it was uh, a challenge at times. And you say, you know, what did we do else? Russell was right. It was a, as near to 24 hour existence as you can get. Um, but certainly weekends sort of didn't exist for anybody. We had people there living for most of the time. Most people being Cambridge computer graduates, we used to eat at the grad pad at the Cambridge University Centre. So you know, there would be sort of a, a, a trek around sort of dinner time to the grad pad, you know, where people would eat, and uh, then the trek would go back to uh, Great Shelford, and we'd get on with it again and uh, into the into the e evening. That wasn't that strange for most of us. If you did computer science at Cambridge at the time, you lived a nocturnal life anyway. So I guess it was just what we did. Having said that, there were a few evenings that we managed to uh, be persuaded by uh, Chris Curry to join him at uh, Shades or Crusts or <laughs> some of the watering holes in the, around King's Parade. So Not very often, though, of course. <laughs> so you've gone through that difficult phase of trying to get the computers established and you were, you were found. So once you've gone past that, how, how did things wind from there on? Uh, then began the uh, constant uphill battle of marketing and sales. And that was actually really interesting as well because if you think about when we hit the market, it was sort of you know, 82, 83, um, you know, we had absolute vision, we knew what we wanted to do, we had had a great idea. The British press were generally even behind us, which uh, you know, was pretty interesting. But there was one little cloud on the horizon. A small company called IBM had decided that it was going to launch a thing called the personal computer. And really that set the scene for the, the way the market was going to move. We'd grown up in a world where the torch was a, you know, a ground up machine designed from scratch, very well crafted software and hardware very clear market, but software that basically had to be tailored for it, or certainly tailored for you know, a little bit of uh, movement beyond the standard CPM world. IBM came along and essentially you know, changed the market by producing a commodity device. And it was from then on that the, the challenges in the, the, the marketing sort of uh, came about. Yeah, many, many, could, many would say really that the commodity device was uh was already in existence before IBM came along. Uh, I remember giving a speech at Comdex Europe in 1982 and walking around and meeting uh, lots of people uh, from the USA and seeing the presence of Intel already then with the uh, uh, 80, 86 chip yep. and you could see 16-bit. Uh, nobody really knew whether 8-bit or 16-bit were better other than 16 was twice 80. It was twice 8 and uh, that was it really. So there were uh, companies like Victor Technologies, Chuck Pedal, who had, was a serial uh, creator of, of computers. Uh, he was there at, at Comdex with, uh, with in fact Victor Technologies and Sirius and uh, we could see that IBM who launched the uh, PC in, I think it was about March of 82. Our launch was actually two months later in April of 82. And there was, a, uh, I guess, a window of opportunity to make some sales, but also recognize that we had to get straight back to the drawing board uh, with development of a bigger and better machine, which 
actually we, we did, it was the Motorola 68000 uh, chip that was chosen, which might have been a bad call because probably if we'd gone down the Intel route, uh, we'd have made more sales. Yeah, so, so the, the afterlife after the original torch machines, which were based on uh, Z80 add-ons to a BBC um, technology, were ground-up designed 68,000 machines to run Unix. So it, we were actually one of the early um, producers of what later got called Unix workstations. So the, the first torch, the triple X, that had Unix on it, um, came out um, and it was launched um, within um, two months of Sun launching the Sun 2 on the market uh, place. So we were actually sort of, you know, quite a long way uh, advanced again in what we were doing technically. As Russell says though, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, being a business machine, you know, perhaps the 8086 route would have been a significantly better route to go down. But even so, the triple uh, X machine still maintained a, you know, a good degree of sales, um, perhaps not quite to the level that uh, we might have liked. Mm. And also, I think, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we should probably have gone uh, to investors for at least 10 million or 20 million mm. Uh, because this was the sort of money that was, was going down in uh, Silicon Valley. And we had one hell of an advantage. It's a, a typical British story, I'm afraid. Yeah, uh, and actually I'll, I'll, I'll um, call out one piece of what I consider to be really bad advice we got given by every investor we talked to, and that was don't try to break it in America. And, and in hindsight, that was exactly the wrong thing to do because the scale of the market we had available to us in the UK meant we just didn't get the volumes of scale there. So you know, if we'd have uh, actually, as Russell said, got a bit more money, um, and instead of saying we're going to stay in Silicon Fem, but had uh, spawned something into Silicon Valley, things could have been very different. And I think probably the investors gave us that advice because we did actually go to America. <laughs> we first went to Canada, to Toronto. Martin and myself yep. went and opened an office to actually sell Acorn Atoms, and we hired a local sales manager. I think we put Peter Headland in. And, and uh, Peter Headland there, I ran it for a while yeah. as well. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 And these Acorn Atoms sold. We made money out of that. And we also went to Boston and set up a, an office in Boston. But we had no sales from Boston. No. And th the purpose for the office in Boston was to make sure that we could get the computer certified by the... Uh, uh, FCCA, FCC. FCC, and uh, this was not going to happen. There was a, there was a new test every day by the FCC that you had to comply with in order to have your uh, computer certified for sale in the in the U.S. market. So I think we dumped a hell of a lot of money uh, actually having that office whilst this process was going on. Do you feel do you think that was deliberate in terms of trying to restrict external competition coming into the US? I'm not sure whether I could be sued with my answer for that. Uh, so I, I should so imagine. I'll, I'll plead the Fifth Amendment but since we're talking about America. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will tell you one little funny story about uh, the, the Toronto office. Peter Headland was a, a mean piano player and uh, passionately interested in music and he was in the office one Saturday morning and he had a phone call and uh, at the end of the telephone call there's a gentleman who said hi I've uh, bought this Acorn Atom and I'd like to know how to program it please so uh, are there any places which I can where I can get uh, some lessons and Peter said well unfortunately um, no we've got manuals for it but um, so uh, but uh, I don't know if there are any places where there are lessons in, uh, in uh, Acorn Basic. But I can find out. Can you let me your, know your name? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Oscar Peterson. What? <laughs> yeah, it's Oscar Peterson. No, come on. The Oscar Peterson? Yes. And actually, Pete then traded him some private lessons in how to program the Acorn Atom in return for some lessons on how to play jazz. <laughs> So True story. Oscar, what did Oscar want the computer for? He was passionately interested in uh, hobbies, computers, home computers. So he bought an Acorn Atom. And, uh, and actually, it's, it's interesting, Russell 
uh, talked about Pete Headland there. One of the things Pete did after um, you know, Torch split up was he went away and ran a company that was involved in electronic music and um, you know, using things like BBC micros and PCs to actually develop music on. Again, you know, it's the way things are done now, but it, it was you know, very early days then. Now, just thinking about it, uh, Peter did actually manage to find some time to do things outside of the office, because I remember going to his house and being amazed that there were two six-foot-high speakers about uh, a metre wide, and the most beautiful speakers you've ever seen, and uh, I think they were about £3,000 then. God knows what that is in today's money. It must be close to 100 I would say. Yeah, and, and also, <coughs> just to get some idea, this wasn't a mansion. This was a uh, terraced house off um, Mill, Mill Road. Yeah, he, he got on very well with the neighbours. <laughs> Not 